Welcome to Vintage SF. I'm Richard Rempel. What's up with this thumbnail? Well, my friend Matt from Science Fiction Reads was going to go into his sleep study. He experiences insomnia, so they're trying to help him. He got all wired up, and then he sent Ira and I this photo. And it has the book that we're going to discuss today. So we don't talk about whether this book put him to sleep or whether it kept him awake. But we're going to discuss the best of Fritz Leiber today. Today, we're going to get back into the best of series. It's from the classic science fiction library by Ballantine Books, books that were published in the 1970s. Today, I'm joined by Ira from SF Words of Wonder. Matt from Science Fiction Reads. Welcome, guys. It's great to be together again. So each of us has a playlist where we have put the videos that we've created for the best ofs. We've looked at three books so far. We've looked at the best of Hal Clement, of Lee Brackett, and Frederick Brown. And those are the covers. And today, we're going to look at the best of Fritz Leiber, but my cover doesn't match your covers. Their print is earlier than my print. My print is from, I think, 1979, and I believe yours is from 1974, perhaps. Yes. But what I do know is both of these pictures on the cover do represent a story that's in the book. So we'll get to that. Uh, I thought I'd talk about it a little bit, just sort of our, our icebreaker here. When you go on vacation, one of the things that I like to do is visit used bookstores that uh, we find along the way. Uh, do you have any stories about bookstores you found or perhaps books that you found while you were on vacation? Yeah, I do the same thing. Anytime I go on vacation, I'm uh, looking up used bookstores um, and also little free libraries. There's actually an app. I can't remember the name um, that will show you like in each city where they are. And you can, uh, I mean, if the city's big enough, you can make a day just of it, just driving around to little free libraries. Uh, my experience has been there's not often science fiction, <laughs> but it is fun to drop science fiction off, um, put it out in the wild for other people. But yeah, I'm always looking for used bookstores and uh, thrift stores, or even I'll search Facebook Marketplace for the area I'm in, because um, you never know what you're going to find. But uh, most recently, I went up to uh, like Huntsville, Muskoka area in Ontario. Uh, I've gone the last three years, and the previous two years, I went to... Uh, second story books in a little town called Rousseau or Rousseau, uh, but they were closed. So I had no idea uh, what it was like in there until this time, this year I went uh, and they were open and I found a, a pretty rare Harlan Ellison copy of short stories, which I sold on eBay for $150, which funds more book buying. Uh, that's another part of my goal when I'm on vacation. I'm always going to buy books, but it's nice if you can find one to pay for uh, what it cost to buy all those books. So that's extra fun, trying to find something that will uh, cover the cost. <laughs> so I would recommend uh, in that area, a uh, little tiny store called Second Story Books, uh, or my favorite, uh, when I go on vacation in that area, in um, uh, Perry Sound has uh, barely used books, which I put a teaser in my most recent video, I think it was. It's a massive bookstore with huge science fiction uh, and fantasy selection, which I had no idea until I went there the first time and walked in and was just blown away. Uh, yeah, that's my story. <laughs> yeah, and me, me and my wife, we love to travel. We've been together for a little over 20 years, and we've always gone to bookstores. And I guess it's, it's you know, traveling can get expensive. And so we found some kind of cheaper things to do, like go to state capitals or any kind of public buildings. Um, checking out libraries in some cities are really cool, but bookstores, while that can be thrifty sometimes, sometimes it can get expensive, but whenever we've traveled, we've always stopped in mostly at used bookstores. And I, we, we've been to some of the big, like most popular ones like Powell's in Portland, Oregon. And it's just amazing. You could spend almost all day there, but those stores get picked through kind of they they're very popular so i've always found the smallest little stores in some of these little towns sometimes have the best books and 
whenever I take, especially like vintage science fiction books up to the counter to buy them, it, it always happens. Someone just, they start smiling. They're looking at the cover of the books. They maybe have read some of them in the past or have questions. And it's just a great kind of wholesome thing to, to go around and do whenever we travel. So that's my tip is like, look for the little stores that are in the little towns and you might find good books, but you probably have some good interactions with the people there too. And libraries is a good one too. Uh, they often have like a little free section or a little yeah. like for sale yeah. section. I found good stuff in those too. Yeah. I agree with both of you. One of the things I love about libraries is generally cities make them one of their architectural gems. And so it's a lot of fun just to look around in the, uh, the building itself. I've recently went on a trip where I stopped in Boston and that library is amazing. And it actually had a library sale that was on at the time too. And I was able to pick up a, a Nespa book at that time, which was really good. I couldn't believe it was there. On the travel though, I remember in Detroit finding a place called John K. King, which was four floors in an old industrial type building of books. And then another annex of rare books uh, attached to the building. Uh, that was the most amazing store I've ever seen. Uh, you can find that in a video if you were interested in watching. But just recently, I just went to uh, Riding Mountain National Park. It's here in Manitoba, Canada. My wife and I, part of our honeymoon, we had stopped over there. And so uh, for our 37th anniversary, we went over there again. And just below the town of Wasa Gaming in, national, in the National Park, there is a little town called Onanol, and there was a place called Poor Michael's Emporium that was an amazing bookstore, coffee shop, art and, and craft type of store. And it had an unbelievable collection. I think everybody who, all the Lake Country people would just bring books there and trade them in for other books to read in the cabin or, or in the park. And, uh, I found some interesting ones there, but you're, you, when you're talking about the little bookstores, I agree. Some of the most, some of the smallest towns that we've stopped in, and if I found a used bookstore, I can find some of the rarest type of books. Uh, the one other one I'll mention is in St. Catharines, Ontario. I stopped in a used bookstore, which was frankly kind of a mess, really hard to find things. Books were stacked sideways on the shelves, like I have that sideways there, and they were two or three layers deep. But uh, that's where I found a Franz Werfel book. I'm trying to remember the name. Star now. of the Unborn. That's the one. Yeah. You know, I'll talk about it in the future because I've tried to read it. I went about halfway through and stopped. I'm going to try again a little bit later. Um, obviously, Matt from BookPilled loves this book. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be there when I do finally talk about it. But I was just amazed to find it. It was the only paperback printing there ever was of this book. And it was two bucks. <laughs> I'm just grinning as I go to the counter with it. It's a lot of fun stopping it at the in at those small used bookstores the uh smallest used bookstore i ever stopped in um was driving through my nearby city of belleville by which i mean it was a van and he would just pull over in cities and just open up and you crawled through and i found some stanislaw lemon there <laughs> i forgot to take pictures uh and i was kicking myself after because our video for the the channel but uh it was really cool and I can't remember what it was called. Uh, otherwise, I'd look it up or reference it. But probably the smallest bookstore I've been to. I always find myself a little shy about taking pictures or video inside a yeah. store. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of awkward. Yeah. But we'll see if I can get over that. <laughs> so we have the best of Fritz Liber. Liber is his name. Uh, I've seen him talk on uh, YouTube at a convention in the early 70s and he made sure that the person he was talking to pronounced his name correctly so sometimes i have trouble with pronunciation of names but i wanted to make sure i had that one right i've read some of his work before i read the big time which uh, is an award-winning novel but it's really short i didn't like it so much and i've also read 
a novella called You're All Alone. That one was spectacular. So I've had to start with a very up and down relationship with him. I don't know, have any of you or have either of you read Fritz Leiber before? I read The Wanderer and I posted a video of that on my channel and I actually took that clip of him correcting that person on YouTube mm -hmm. and putting it, put it in the beginning of the video because I didn't want anybody to, um, you know, say I mispronounced it or anything. So if you can take it from the horse's mouth, that's usually the best way. That, on a side note, that's also how I got the pronunciation of Simic. I, have, I found a video of him pronouncing his own last name as Simic. Okay. I've had people correct me. Is it, they say C as an S-E-A, C-Mac, or is it Sim, S-I-M-A-C, Simac? I'll send you the video and you can, it's, it's <laughs> kind of an older video, but the way I heard it was Simic. 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 Okay. But um, The Wanderer was interesting. It was very unique. It had multiple point of views. And I believe it was one of the first books that kind of really dove into this to tell a story from all these different points of view throughout the whole story. But there was some really some some parts of it that did not age well at all. And overall, even the story was was just OK to me. Um, I've always wanted to read more of his work. It, it just seems like he's he's got such a unique style and he has a blend from what I can tell, especially from reading these short stories, he can blend fantasy, horror, science fiction, even just regular fiction. And he has just this unique twist on these stories. So I know there's some books that I'm going to like more of his, but I just need to like, I am going to read big time soon. I want to reread it after having read some of his other work as well. Uh, that's one of those ones I think I would like to reevaluate. Um, I read one short story collection of his, I think maybe called Ships to the Stars or something, which had one or two of these in it. And it was just okay. Like uh, similar to this collection, some I liked, some I didn't. And one other short story in this I read somewhere else and I tried to figure out where, but I couldn't figure it out. I want to check out his, maybe what he's more well known for his uh Fawford and the Grey Mouser stories mm -hmm. his sword and sorcery which um I have them I just need to get to them so I'm excited to start those but otherwise uh, haven't read much of his I was a little disappointed that we didn't have a story or two of those in this collection I would like to experience yeah. that too I guess because they're not science fiction and it's mostly science fiction fantasy that's know. true it hasn't uh, prevented any of the other authors kind of from delving mm. out off of science fiction true <laughs> <laughs> my understanding from some of the uh the vets that i've talked to in science fiction is that there really wasn't much of a distinction between science fiction and fantasy uh until late 70s early 80s where they sort of separated them but before that you know it was very common for a collection to have both i mm -hmm. guess i should say an anthology to have both yeah. mm -hmm. So getting to the stories here in the best of Fritz Leiber, the introduction to the book was by Paul Anderson and the afterword by, was by Fritz Leiber himself. And I want to see if you have some thoughts on that. I just want to share one quote that was in the afterword. And obviously Fritz Leiber was sharing this. Edmund Cooper wrote in the Sunday Times of London, Fritz Leiber has a wicked imagination, wicked enough to make us laugh at an impossible future containing nightmarish aspects of our own times of what i read in the introduction and the in the afterward that kind of rang the most true to me in terms of what i saw in these stories i don't know was there something that struck you uh in those areas yeah so i i get a lot of that there is kind of a edge to a lot of his stories and i think some of those maybe weren't my favorite, um, but he, there was quite the range overall in in here. And when I finished the book, I read I read the afterwards by Fritz, and some of those things kind of just made me think a little bit more. And the way Fritz even talked about some of his own stories, I went back and reread a few, and 
ended up liking them a lot more on the second read through. Um, I guess maybe knowing a little bit about his style or, or what these books were kind of, or these stories were about helped out a little bit on deciphering some of them. There was a couple stories he talked about where he had a war situation in them and he talked about being a pacifist and that, kind of unlocked a little bit about those stories I found uh, going back to them. Yeah. And those two, the the two war war ones were kind of like my least favorite and maybe I just didn't fully understand, but. Yeah. Uh, I had similar experience. Yeah. A couple of disorienting uh, stories. <laughs> I could probably guess what everyone's favorite was in this one. I might Want be way off. Stab but... I'm not sure if I have a favorite actually. <laughs> okay. Well, my, my favorite was probably the most true science fiction out of this batch, and it was the, A Pale of Air. Mm -hmm. I really liked that one. I was just going to say, that's the one I had previously read, but could not track down where I had read it. So you yeah. want to tell us a little bit of what the story is about? Yeah, it's basically, you kind of don't really know what's going on at first, and there's this family kind of huddled in this this space, and they have a fire going, and they need to go outside and actually pull pails of air out of the out of the atmosphere because it's all condensed and, and froze because you find out later that the planet got knocked out of orbit and it's leaving the solar system. So you get no heat from the sun or anything like that. And so they send one of their children out to get a pail of air and they scoop it up and bring it in and melt it. And that's, they need to, keep their little shelter like saturated with air so they could live and they do the same thing with water and it was just like real imaginative and i i probably won't spoil it but there is a a pretty interesting ending to that one too as well that really uh it, it opened it up i almost felt like that could have been a longer story and it, i think that was one of the shorter ones out of here I was just going to say it's a very dark atmosphere, uh, but it does have a happier ending than you, you would yeah. expect. And it, it I think bleak. it would make a really good stretched out story mm -hmm. a little longer. And it truly was a, a hard SF kind of story. Yeah, uh, It was very interesting to see that there was layers of the atmosphere that had condensed down onto the ground and so they were scooping from that sediment layer that was oxygen to make sure that they had air to breathe mm -hmm. and uh, it was very disorienting at the beginning to think yeah. about going out to get pails of air i think there was a throw away line that the father was a scientist and they had they knew this was going to happen and they tried setting something up and it fell apart or something so mm -hmm. you know in his haste he scrambled to kind of like wasn't it like the corner of a warehouse or something? And they kind of put like blankets up, like 30 layers of blankets. So the air is always escaping, but very slowly. Yeah. It was, it was pretty, it was kind of like the Martian, you know, coming up with uh, scientific ways to survive. Mm -hmm. Any other stories you want to talk about, Ira? Well, the only other one that I really remember reading in the past was going to roll the bones. And that was, cause that one is in, dangerous visions and i didn't that's, yeah that's, that's what this cover is right here and it's probably hard to see but his eyes are actually ones on dice so it's snake eyes yeah and i i didn't really like it when i read it in dangerous visions and this time i didn't really like it either i i will say it's got style um but you know it's got a very unlikable character it's it's got all, and I know it's it's not the point of the book to or the story to to have, you know, be wholesome or not every story has to be that way. But it's pretty pretty dark and and goes into some strange territories. But it's very imaginative, and um, that's so that's the only other one that I really remember reading in the past. And then the other one that I really liked, which kind of just seemed like fiction it did have a science fiction twist at the end but it was called the ships that sail at midnight and it's about that the, those four people who you know they're hanging out in a restaurant or a bar and there's this mysterious kind of waitress and 
they end up kind of all falling in love with her and she doesn't really, she doesn't take sides and she, she wants to love all of them equally. And it creates a bunch of issues. Uh, it goes beyond a love triangle, whatever, a quadrangle, I guess, a love quadrangle or five way love triangle. Um, but, and then it has kind of a unique twist at the end that kind of brings it into kind of more of a science fiction flair. But the, the thing I liked about that one was just the prose. It just had a kind of this quiet, nice tone to it. And, and I thought it was really well written. And that was probably one of my second favorites. And then, you know, a bunch of the other ones I sort of liked. And then there was some I just didn't really like at all. The, uh, the one you were just mentioning, The Ship Sails at Midnight, it reminded me a bit of a Stephen King story. Um, not that he has one like this, but it felt like it could have been written as a Stephen King story. And I know you like Stephen King. Yeah. Um, it had, uh, you hadn't mentioned that this waitress, this uh, very interesting, beautiful waitress, somehow brought out the best in them in the things that they were talented in that it would sort of take them up another level in what they were talented in. And so there's already sort of a, it's not a mystical or even supernatural quality. It's something about how she can bring the best out in people. Yeah. It could it's have been just a fiction story for most of it mm -hmm. until the kind of events at the end kind of unfold a little bit, but yeah. Any, anyone I think with the right, you know, demeanor and, and they can really pull the best out of people. And this lady had a, a knack for it. And like each one of them had a different background, right? There was a artist, an author, a scientist and a psychologist, I think. So each one of them had like just a unique interaction with this lady. And I thought it was done really well. Yeah. Uh, there's two that I really liked above all the uh, others. Uh, the man who never grew young, but there's not much to say about it. It's very short. Um, and it's kind of the opposite of one of my favorites from our Frederick Brown uh, stories. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in the Frederick Brown story, there's this guy who's somehow accidentally become immortal and he's just chronicling time passing and what his experience is like. Uh, and in The Man Who Never Grew Young, it's kind of the opposite. This guy is immortal, um, but slowly we see that his life is a little different than ours. Everything in his reality runs backwards, um, including aging. Everybody starts out elderly and slowly, um, you know, grows to be a baby and then ceases to exist. Except for him, this guy's kind of stuck in his 30s. Um, but it's super short. I guess what I liked most about it was the idea. I like the idea of being immortal and seeing the future, but I think maybe even more cool would be to be immortal and be traveling back in time. You get these great passages of all these great empires from our past that are not so much rising and declining, but just popping up out of nowhere and then declining because it's all happening backwards. And it kind of ends, he's sitting on the side of the Nile, uh, the pyramid, the great pyramids are being dismantled and he kind of thought a couple of times throughout history that maybe this reversing or decline is kind of coming to an end or a standstill. And he really thought that was the case with Egypt because it was such a long lasting empire with very little change. But then even that kind of ceases to be, and it, he's kind of just reflecting um, how it'll probably never cease until man is once again with the animals. And I just thought, how cool to, uh, to live through prehistory. <laughs> lonely but uh, a, a very tragic and interesting character i think you're right that it's a good companion piece for that brown story yeah it's uh, like the complete opposite but uh yeah. it's really good yeah, it made me think of that one as well and he he did pack a lot into that little short story because yeah. it's almost like entropy had reversed and everything was going back to the big bang or something and this this person and was yeah, like, basically a hint that maybe this was the cause of a human nuclear war. Something humanity did screwed everything up. Yeah. I guess he's just so long lived, he's kind of forgotten his own origins or how it came about. But uh, And he kind of amuses to himself. It's kind of funny he remembers Hitler. Like, oh, I remember this guy, and now here I am living through it backwards. <laughs> like, 
Yeah. And then his, Hitler just fades into history as a footnote kind of thing. Really neat. Um, the other one I really liked was The Enchanted Forest, which mm. uh, I thought, okay, this is going to be a fantasy. And it was, you know, the complete opposite. Um, had some hard SF elements, but again, very short. The background story is all just really just jotted down in a few sentences where we, we've got this guy who's fleeing in, I think, hyperspace, right? From another guy in hyperspace. I'm trying to remember what they were called. <laughs> were they the SOS? Or is that the that one? was the name of the society, but this last member oh, of yeah. some planet where these people don't really conform. They're, they're risk takers. They really don't fit in with the rest of the galaxy. And so... I guess the gov the powers that be decided to exterminate that planet, but this guy escaped and around his neck, he has like the genetic codes or files to everybody uh, from his planet. And he's basically trying to escape, hide and bring about his race again, basically. Um, and he crashes out of hyperspace, but he escapes the pursuers, but he crash lands on some random planet out of all the millions of planets. Um, he's landed on a planet that's just covered in these vines uh, but he's got a you know a cool death laser that <laughs> shoots a tunnel through uh, the vines, and so he travels in one straight line, and the vines are constantly closing in. They're very strange how they come back so quickly. Uh, but he figures, I just need to hopefully find some sort of humanity, and um, they will help. I can use them to my advantage, and you know, get my race going again. And he comes into this little clearing with you know a couple buildings, a couple livestock, and just four humans. Um, but they live a very simple uh, life. They don't really have any knowledge of um, galactic affairs or even their planet. So he spends a night with them. They're very friendly. And the next day he sets out through the forest again. And by the end of the night, he comes to another clearing, but it's identical and it's the same people, but they don't remember him. So it's, you're kind of thinking, um, is this guy going crazy? Is he, was, did he escape or is he captured? And he's, you know, he's running things through his mind or they're, They've got him set up to a computer or something. I don't know. I was trying to think what is happening because he's not coming across the same group of people. I think it happens four times. Um, and the, the, people time are, comes, the people are slightly different. Their personalities yeah, each time. Their personalities, how they receive mm -hmm. this stranger in their lives is always a little different. Uh, the first group, they're very positive and welcoming. The second group is terrified for no reason. Um, another group is welcoming, but overwhelmingly so and uh, he he's got to escape i mean the second group he murdered because they were so suspicious of him <laughs> um and i don't want to spoil it but uh it does end up having just a very ironic twist this guy just had some real bad luck um it just did not go where i was thinking it was going i don't know if we want to spoil it or or not but uh i really enjoyed it i do want to talk about it a little bit with a couple other stories and I will say one thing. I don't think it'll spoil it, but it might give an even better hint to people about what might be going on. Uh, okay. But I'll, I'll get to that after you, uh, you finish okay. talking about the story. I just it, it reminded me of one other story I've read, a James H. Smith story um, that involves this race. Again, there's only a few members left, but they've got digital copies of everyone. But these guys are pretty malevolent. Um, it's the only other story I can think of where an entire race is just kind of hidden as data and kind of in both stories, it doesn't work out too good <laughs> for these races <laughs> that are kind of in suspended animation. Um, reminded me of that. Um, and it was another one that had a couple hard SF elements, but it was more SF ish. So I guess that's why I really appeal. It appealed to me. Those were the two that I really uh, enjoyed. The ship sails at midnight was another one. And there were bits and pieces of other stories I liked, but, often those stories ended up confusing me. <laughs> one, one that I think is a little bit confusing or is more of an atmospheric one was The Big Trek. And your covers, I think, are portraying that one yes. where there's this march of alien creatures and these this astronaut, two of them, right? They wake up and see them just tracking across this alien landscape uh, is it on Mars? I can't remember if it was or not. Uh, no, it's Earth. It's Earth. Okay. Anyways, and they're tracking towards a a whole potentially in space time continuum, 
and it's just about that walk and yeah how they dive into the hole and and, and that's about it um it, it left a lot of questions <laughs> it did so it was very Our, interesting very dramatic but not very satisfying no <laughs> But I thought I should mention that since that's on your cover of your book. Um, yeah, when you're it, talking... was, it was just a strange one. Like, uh, yeah. I think these creatures were brought into the future along with the human to kind of witness the future destruction of Earth or something. You know, everybody's <laughs> just kind of walking around looking at a desolated Earth and then they jump into a portal. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It made me think briefly, you know, is this the the two by two animals going to the ark, the Noah's yeah. ark or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear. No. So uh when you were talking about let's see here, you were talking about the enchanted forest. I was also thinking of Mariana, which is a short, very short story in here as well, about a girl that you're wondering if she's losing her mind, that she has this ability to it feels like she's physically throwing a switch and things stop being part of reality when she throws those switch and there's different types of switches. Uh, I don't want to go further into the story than that. You, you know, it's a easy, an easy one to find, but it was playing with reality and enchanted force, I think as well was playing with reality. That's the hint I'll give you there. And it reminded me of the novella you're all alone, which to me felt like a precursor to uh, The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, in terms of how it was dealing with reality. Now, there's a lot of science fiction stories about reality, so there could be, a, I think The Matrix has a lot of influences in it. But it was uh, a very enjoyable take on reality. And that's where I saw him playing with both Mariana and the Enchanted Forest. Well, Mariana, to me, felt like a Philip K. Dick story or something. Mm. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, Fritz Leiber has crazy range the, and like the, the different types of stories, like it, his prose can just change if he needs it to. Yeah. And yeah. it just feels like somebody else wrote it. Very. I like that one too. Although at the end I was wondering what's real. <laughs> <laughs> well, and his parents, his dad in specifically was a Shakespearean actor who was actually in some movies and yeah. Fritz Leiber himself did some acting and I think has a bit role in a movie. And he loves Shakespeare. He, he talks about Shakespeare. In fact, there's a story that has uh, a Macbeth element in it in this uh, collection here as well. So he's very dramatic. The big time, the story I want to revisit sometime, is really almost a, a play in one setting. And you can see all these characters talking to each other in this one setting. Uh, and so it felt to me like it, uh, some of his, his work here fit into that playwriting type structure. Uh, or even the screenplay type structure. Is the big time the uh, different soldiers from different eras kind of in the future brought together? I That's correct. Two of the short stories... Are not two of these short stories? Are they not connected to that universe? One of them I want to talk about. It was one of my favorites, okay. actually. It okay. was uh, called "Try and Change the Past." Uh, apparently, it's the first story in the change oh, wars, snakes and change stories. Snakes and what's the opposite of snakes? Spiders. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So snakes and spiders. There's a, a war going on in terms of time travel and trying to change the time and so there's some people who are trying to change time and there's some who are trying to maintain time but time itself really is difficult to change it wants to sort of spring back to what is normal uh and try and change the past was about that it was about a character who was let's call it recruited into the chronological wars that were going on the change wars and he wanted to go back in time to prevent his own uh, murder. He had been murdered just after he had been snatched into this the change wars. And so he does different things to try to prevent his murder, but he's thwarted each time. And the very last one, I won't reveal what it is, but the very last one, 
just takes it to almost a cosmological level of how time is fighting against them. And uh, it was very imaginative and uh, very theatrical. and uh, Dark humor-ish. Dark humor, yeah. And there's yeah. this big mystery that you're trying to understand. Uh, there was a lot going on there that I found attractive. I just want to throw in a quick advertisement if you're interested in uh, altering time during a war. Barrington J. Bailey's The Fall of Chronopolis. Great, great book um, about fighting a war by changing time. Very cool. I've raved about it before. <laughs> yeah. Well, I definitely, anytime I've found a Barrington J. Bailey book, I've been trying to purchase him whenever I found those. I don't think I have that one yet, though. Yeah, try and change the past. That was one that was really easy to digest for me anyways. It was very straightforward, but yeah, it had had some really unique twists and in the way he like you said, it, it isn't just people involved in preventing a, a murder. It goes beyond that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I also want to talk about wanted and enemy. Mm. Uh, <laughs> on this one, we have a person, a man, who has gone to Mars to talk to the Martians, and he wants to convince them to come and invade Earth. To, But he just wants them to invade Earth until humanity stops fighting each other and fights the Martians. And then he kind of wants the Martians to finish the war and leave, and mankind will be united. That's That seems to be the... The big, the big plot idea that he has here. I think, I think he wants, the Martians are going. Yeah, <laughs> why why should we invade Earth? Like what? Yeah. what? <laughs> You're not even on our radar. Like <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't care about you. Um, and so uh, it's one of those stories that could be a Twilight Zone style story where he does put Earth onto the radar now and uh all, in a very comical ending too <laughs> yeah, like, yeah okay yeah. it didn't work with these guys but i'll try again <laughs> and so this is one of the ones that he claims this is sort of his pacifist uh uh ideals coming out uh obviously he's gone through world war ii and his parents uh through world war one and so there's a lot of things to unpack for many authors in this golden age into the 1950s time I think there's one more story that we should talk about. Maybe I'll ask if you want to talk about it first because it's his most acclaimed and awarded story that none of us have talked about coming attraction. Uh, does anybody want to say something about it? <laughs> okay. My only note for it is disorienting. So <laughs> I don't even remember which it is yet. <laughs> You'll have to fill me it's in. It's the one in the beginning, there's like those cars driving around with fish hooks and they're trying oh. to rip skirts off of the ladies. <laughs> it's like they're trying to drive as close as they can to them. That's this is in better New York. Going than, that's better than going to roll the bones, really. Well, I think roll the bones was like something he wrote for Ellison and um, actually maybe gave him some he, later fame. I think he wrote it and then sat on it for a while and then he was able to submit it for dangerous visions but he had to tweak it a bit but mm -hmm. i i know it won the the hugo and the nebula so i'm just surprised yeah um yeah go ahead yeah and coming coming attraction like i i kind of got what was going on at first and then these these ladies are they're like wearing masks and nothing else basically the fashion has evolved to where you want to hide your face but you're not ashamed to bear everything else right and and then this guy, he saved this girl from this, this car that was going to race by and almost take her out. And so she kind of invites him back to her apartment. And then he gets kind of involved in um, a bunch of stuff going on there. But I kind of understood the basic plot, but I, I feel like there was some other things going on in this one too, that would, would probably, I, this is not one that I reread, but um, this is one that I could see maybe rereading again because in the end I I got what I thought was most of the plot of the book and I thought it was just okay. But it's like you said, Richard, it's so um, renowned. I felt like I was missing something maybe. 
it really paints a picture of a uh, society where Soviet Union and United States have been in a, a nuclear war. Um, part of Manhattan has experienced a nuclear explosion, but there's still North Manhattan and South Manhattan. That doesn't seem too realistic to me if there was an explosion there, but United States has gone into a place where they are almost a fascist style government. They've gone ultra conservative on terms of covering people's faces with masks, but yet there's some strange parts, as you're saying, in terms of where they wouldn't be dressed. This story was kind of about that, but it was also uh, about what is happening behind the mask. This lady herself had a psychological reason that she was coming on to the main character. She actually was married and she had an abusive marriage and she was playing into this abusive marriage by coming on to this man. The story seems to be about masks and removing these masks and seeing more of what the ugliness or motives are behind them. That's as best as I could try to get through the story on a literary level. I've just recently finished looking through the Science Fiction Hall of Fame book that was put together by the Science Fiction Writers of America, and this story was in there. It was a story that I found difficult to read as well, but I read it a second time as we were going through this book here too. And I think that literary level, that portrayal of society and masks is why it resonated with a lot of people. I don't think the narrative story as much resonated with people. Yeah, I definitely That's felt that. like there was another layer that I kind of, you know, I was, he, he spent so much time talking about, you know, the radiated parts of New York and he knew that there was something playing in with the, you know, Soviets and in the U S but then the, the plot of the story was following along with this lady and her husband and this guy who kind of gets suckered in a bit to in almost in their little love game. But yeah, I felt like there was definitely something that I could probably take away on a second read. I, I marked that one as a reread at some point, probably. Um, another one I, I didn't mind and I also found comical was uh, the man who made friends with electricity. Mm. Yeah. Just a, a guy that moves into town and just sits outside of a transformer or something, listening to the hum of the electricity and thinks it's talking to him. Uh, and the realtor who uh, rented him the place is quite skeptical. Uh, Cause every time he visits, this guy just talks about what the electricity is telling him. Um, <laughs> but then when the guy finds out that the electricity is not just, you know, spreading around America, it, it gets over to Russia too. The guy's like, Oh, electricity is a communist. Uh, and then he, he threatens the electricity, like, I'm going to go to the CIA. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know if it was supposed to be as comical as it reads, but I, I think it, it is. Yeah, I found it quite comical. Yeah, there was a few stories talking about some similarities with him and Philip K. Dick. This is one that kind of made me think a little bit of his style where you know, you have some crazy person, and but you don't know if they're really crazy or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And it was funny, the that realtor, he was so, everybody that moved in, like, moved out because they couldn't handle this hum. And then this guy loved it. And he's like, what's the matter yeah. with this guy? And the ending yeah, of that I one's pretty good, too, because the electricity's big brother started threatening this guy, right? <laughs> yeah. And, that's and so the realtor... Cool. The realtor's like, he gets the whole picture and just decides, ah, I'm just going to keep this to myself. <laughs> yeah, and even when the guy calls him, he's like, ah, he sounds like he's in trouble. I'll come check on him tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> when it's obviously too late. So I think the viewer can tell that there's quite a few stories in this book. Yeah. And uh, I think we, all three of us are having some up and down experiences with these stories. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Would you like to sort of give a little wrap up for yourself in terms of uh, how you felt about this one or well, you got something else? One thing I th think I should just mention, um, you know, the love of science fiction writers and cats. Oh, There's yes. The cat story in here called um, oh. Space Time for Springers. Yes. And I can't believe we haven't spoke about that. 
I know. Yeah. Hmm. And you know, the thing about it though, is like the way it was set up, I was like, this is going to be so great. And I was kind of a little bit let down with where he went with it. Um, it was well, still again, pretty interesting. I, I got lost right at the end, right in the final couple paragraphs. I became unsure of what happened. Um, but it's a really good story. He's got a very strong protagonist. Gimmick. Yeah. Is that yeah. the name? Yeah. yeah the yeah. Should we set it up? It's it's sure. from the point of view from the point of view of this fairly young cat. I don't think it's quite a kitten, but it's quite young. Um, and just for I don't know if the cat has above average intelligence or just believes it does. It it thinks it's got things figured out. It thinks it's going to eventually be invited to sit at the table with the humans and share a cup of coffee, like because that's what it observes humans doing. And it thinks when I get that cup of coffee, I'm going to transform into a god, which in his eyes is just a human being, you know, a being with all these powers and abilities. And probably around the same time, uh, the human's child, which is a little slow in development and kind of evil, that kid will probably turn into a cat because that's how life works. Um, and it doesn't quite work out the way the cat expects, but it was very interesting kind of reminded me of the Frederick Brown story with the the scientist and the intelligent mouse. Mm. Um, but again, right at the very end, I kind of lost focus on what was happening or what did occur. <laughs> I can just imagine Liber just watching his cats and thinking yeah. these <laughs> silly, crazy thoughts. And I don't have cats, but my kids do. They're just very interesting creatures. It's hard to see or understand what's going on in those eyes but there does seem to be some malevolence, not the right word. There's a mischievous <laughs> intelligence going on there that is alien to us. And it, it's fun to watch them. Yeah. But in, in this story, I, I don't know how far this is going into spoiler, but I mean, these, these are kind of short stories, I guess. But the, the child that had kind of the mental disabilities, it was trying to set up the cat right, with what it was doing to the baby to make it look like the baby had harmed this baby or like, make, make it look like the cat had harmed the baby. Yeah. And so but, the, the cat caught on to it. Which made me think, okay, does the cat have above int average intelligence or is it just being a cat? But then it has, you know, the two have their showdown and I couldn't tell if there was a swapping of consciousness or... yeah. Like, how did the cat help the daughter overcome her disability? I couldn't figure it out. All they did was kind of have a showdown and then uh, worked out great for the family and the daughter <laughs> and the cat. But I just didn't understand what exactly happened. Yeah, what it did, he did insinuate that there was some sort of transfer or something. But And there was also hints that the father knew the cat was yeah. intelligent. So yeah. And he knew the cat didn't do it. Yeah, right. that's true. That too. Yeah. If some of our viewers can help us out here, <laughs> just comment below. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts other. on that. <laughs> I, I want to know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other stories or anything else that we should mention before we go into sort of a wrap up of it? No, it's it's kind of funny because you know, thinking about it, I, I thought I'd I disliked more of these, and maybe I just like disliked reading them. But the yeah. <laughs> ideas at the end and like the takeaways of what he was writing, you know, I, I'm looking back on them a lot more fondly and I'm thinking like, which ones didn't I like? There was, <laughs> there was definitely the True. couple about war that I didn't like and um, a couple other ones. But overall, it was kind of average. There was some I really liked. There's some I really disliked and a lot that were kind of average. But I do feel like maybe I, I missed some things that that. And when I did reread some of these, it opened up a lot more to the story. So I think maybe he was just, he's just a literary genius and you can attack these, so even these little short stories on many different levels and get many different things out of them. So. Yeah. I'd say he's the most challenging of the authors we've read together so far. Yeah. Uh, I haven't been left confused as often as I was this time, but I agree with you. Like I'm starting to wonder how many did I not like? Um, because the more we talk about them, the more I'm like thinking of them fondly. 
And there's a couple others I talked about, but I don't want to go too long. But just to say, I think I enjoyed it more than I thought. <laughs> That's interesting to think about books that at the time, you're not sure if you really like it. But as time goes on you and you think about it, it becomes more fond to you. Uh, I've had that happen with individual books like Neuromancer. Yeah. The first time I read it, I was frustrated and disappointed. And then I read it again and blew my mind. <laughs> And Matt, you were just saying Dream, Dream Snake. You said you didn't yeah. really like it, but now you I, think about it. So. I didn't see what all the hype was about. Yet at the same time, I think about that book from time to time in certain scenes. And ever since I got rid of the book, I've wanted to reread it. <laughs> so, And it's a, it's a Hugo or a Nebula winner. So, mm -hmm. Vonda McIntyre, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The only book of hers I've read, I think. Actually, I feel that way a little bit about uh, R.A. Lafferty stories. Um, people who have viewed my channel know I've gone, <laughs> gone quite a journey with Lafferty. And I really feel like there's some writers that you need to read more than once. And you have to give a little bit of time before you read the story again or reread a story again, but that they can actually be very rewarding. And perhaps Fritz Leiber is that, that kind of a writer as well. I think so. I think you've mentioned this before, Richard, where it's, it's a writer's writer. Mm. And, you know, those writers, I think they can see the mastery of what some of these other authors have done. And maybe a average reader or someone who just doesn't pick up on all that doesn't understand how hard it is to write something like that. And so I know he's he's definitely influential and thought very highly of, especially with Paul Anderson's introduction. He says, like, you know, it's just an honor to write the intro to this story or this collection. So as a young kid at a convention who got to meet Fritz Leiber and was one of his <laughs> heroes, that's pretty cool to eventually go on and write the intro. <laughs> yeah, I think here I'm going to throw in a quote that I have here from Paul Anderson. This is from the introduction. These stories don't resolve nicely, don't come with pre-supplied lessons or morals, and are by far the best of the bunch. They recall the short fiction of PKD or J.G. Ballard, unsettling sketches of weird worlds that aren't exactly supposed to be our own future, but might be parables, fantasies, warnings, or some uneasy mixture of these. There are strong elements of myth and magical realism that elevate these stories beyond what you might expect from pulp magazine fiction. I think that's that respect you're talking about that writers have for him. Yeah. They, they see him giving us uneasy stories. And sometimes uneasy stories are ones we rail against at the beginning, but they stick with us and we think about them more. I agree. I always like seeing really famous authors like Paul Anderson praising somebody who I'm not as familiar with because that just hypes me up more and makes me want to want to read them more. Uh, yeah. The first book in this series is the Stanley Weinbaum and mm. Isaac Asimov is just praising him and what could have been if he had lived longer. And that just got me so excited to read his collection. He died. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but he died at the age of 33 and we have a best of book by him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you've recently read one of his short stories. I have. It's it was kind uh, of one of his Martian the stories. Yeah. yeah, Martian Odyssey. That's right. Yeah, I really liked that one. No, <laughs> and I've there's a sequel that. story yeah. to it. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's also in the collection. Hmm. Well, we'll get there. Actually, that reminds me, Matt, you're yes. choosing our next selection because it's going to be on your channel next time. What are we going to read? And I thought about it. I was going to go with Frederick Pohl, but I didn't want to overwhelm Ira because he just read Gateway and he's thinking about reading the <laughs> sequel. <laughs> I didn't want him to be sick of it. Uh, so I picked someone who I'm guessing would be new to all of us. Uh, and that would be Raymond Z. Galoon. Definitely. Speaking of pronunciations, I believe it's pronounced as balloon. So Galoon. Uh, a pulp writer from maybe 30s. I know 40s. Yeah, 30s, 40s, 50s. I think he wrote right up to the 80s. And he's totally new to me. Um, I can't remember reading anything from him. No, no, I don't either. I don't think I had heard of him until uh, I started collecting um, these. So 
I yeah. thought that would be interesting. I figured we probably haven't read anything by him in the last two-ish years. I've really started enjoying early pulp stuff, uh, and he was right in the thick of it. So should be interesting. And we all have it, right? I do. <laughs> I'm the only one yeah. who doesn't have every book yet. Okay. Well, so that'll yeah. be our fifth book. We just finished the fourth one today. All right. Any last thoughts? I would say uh, if you've read a couple stories by him and they weren't for you, give Liber another chance because. Uh, his range is pretty wild. As much as I don't like humor in books, I, I liked his humor. Usually it was kind of just at the end or it was dark. Um, so if that's your thing, uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, definitely worth checking out. And I'll definitely be checking out his Sword and Sorcery next. I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to that. That's called, again, Fared and Mouser? I think it's Fawford and Grey Mouser. Yep. Two Fawford Sword and, and Sorcery Mouser. characters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my, my advice would be if you uh, if you try reading these and you're not liking it, kind of like I did at first, you know, think about it for the style he has or, so, you know, try to read into it a little bit more. Maybe read it a second time. There is definitely some that I did not like and I won't read again. But the ones that I was just intrigued by, I, whenever I read them a second time, they they opened up way more to me. And I think it's just just uh, a challenge to read some of this stuff because he, he's just a really good writer and he can he can layer it in. So it's it's a recommender, though, for sure. And I think it's always fun to read something that has a plot that just propels you forward and you can go through it and you know exactly what's happening. But sometimes the best reads I've ever had are the most challenging reads. And yeah. uh, I would put them in that challenging category where you have to work a little bit to tease out the brilliance that he has and how he writes. Yeah. You might not enjoy it when you're sitting there with your eyes on the page, but it's rewarding for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining me again on uh, this journey here. We go through the, uh, classic library or what is it called again classic science fiction library of writers and this was the best of fritz liber so join us on matt's channel science fiction reads for our next one and thanks, uh, thanks again to matt from science fiction reads and ira from sf words of wonder for joining me today as we talked about this book thanks guys right. thanks thank you take care I hope you enjoyed our conversation. If you have any comments, leave them below. Until next time, keep reading.